All right, we have crossed that bridge into 2 Samuel, but of course you remember it's really just one book. It's the book of Samuel. And the reason they got divided in half um, was simply because of the size of the scroll. So they had standard size scrolls back in the day, and so they had to cut it off somewhere because otherwise you're going to have a hard time carrying that big scroll around everywhere. Uh, and so uh, it's divided into two books, what we would call First and Second Samuel, but it does have a good division, a good, uh, a good breaking point there. So who remembers what happened at the end of First Samuel? Saul died. Saul was defeated. Saul died. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So with with Saul's death, we know who is next in line. Who is now who who's been anointed king to take his place? David. David. All right, so now we get into these early days of David being king, but you would think, okay, well, Saul's out of the way. Everything's going to be smooth. Well, not necessarily. There's still a little bit of work to be able to have David actually occupying the throne, not just of a part of Israel, but of the entire nation of Israel. So we're going to work our way through that uh, tonight. By the way, before I forget, um, so this is our second meeting in February. Our next meeting is three weeks from now, not two weeks from now. We're going to shift to where so far we've been meeting on the first and third. We're going to start meeting on the second and fourth Tuesdays, and we'll do that in March and April as well. So it'll be three weeks before our next meeting. And between now and then, we'll send you out. Pastor Laramie is going to record uh, the next chapters 6 through 10. He's going to do a video lesson for that. He and I are going to be out of town at a conference that first week in March, so you can pray for our travels there. I'll be telling you more about that soon enough. But he'll record a video. And then that first meeting in March, on March 14th, I believe, will be another joint session. So we'll have made it up to 2 Samuel 11 and 12, which is David's sin with Bathsheba, and Psalm 51 goes with that perfectly. And so we'll have a joint session where we consider both the historical narrative in Samuel and then uh, the, the psalm that goes with that as well. So just a heads up on, on what's coming ahead in the next few weeks there. But tonight our goal is to make it through chapters 1 through 5 and to see uh, David to, to begin to actually uh, rule and reign as king. Well, as the chapter begins in 2 Samuel 1, David is going to hear about the death of Saul. In fact, 2 Samuel 1 begins with a short phrase, after the death of Saul. Now, we, uh, when we think of the titles of the books of the Bible, you know, they make sense to us. Well, this is why it's called 2 Samuel. But in Hebrew, that's really what they would have said, after the death of Saul. That's the name of the book because it's the first phrase in the book. And it makes sense because, again, everything we've seen in 1 Samuel is while Saul was ruling and reigning, Israel wanted a king like the nations. They got that in Saul. Now the second half is what happens after Saul dies. And so we get a little recap here in some of this. We remember that uh, David and his men had gone out to strike the Amalekites. And David and his men are now back in Ziklag. Remember, that's the place where they had their camp. And uh, the Amalekites came and stole their wives and children. And David and his men went out and rescued them. But David doing that prevented him from being in the battle where Saul died. Remember that David had been working with the Philistines and it wasn't really clear whose side is he on. And there was that question last time, is David actually going to fight against God's people? And uh, God prevents all that from happening. And so David is nowhere near uh, the death of Saul. And at this point, he doesn't even know about it. So verse two tells us on the third day, behold, or look, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. You remember that's that's a sign of mourning. So this man shows up and he's he's mourning. He, his clothes are dirty. He's got dirt on his head. His clothes are torn. When he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage, bowed down. And David said to him, where do you come from? He said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did it go? Tell me. So at this point, David knows nothing about what has happened. And this man answers. He says, the people fled from the battle. And also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. Well, David hears this and he asks the young man, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? David doesn't want a secondhand report. He wants to know for a fact. How do you know this is true? And the young man gives three reasons. He says, I saw him. I had a conversation with him. And I also have a souvenir from the battle. The young man who told him said, well, by chance, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa. And there was Saul leaning on his spear. Behold, the chariots and the horsemen were close upon him. 
So he's saying, look, I was there. I saw it. Saul has got a spear, that spear that we know Saul always had with him. And that leaning on his spear is, is talking about him taking his own life or falling on his spear and dying. And the chariots, the horsemen of the enemy, they're drawing in on Saul. Things are getting tight. When he looked behind him, that's when Saul looked behind him, he saw me and he called to me and I answered him, here I am. He said to me, who are you? And I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. And he said to me, stand beside me and kill me. For anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood beside him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And the third line of proof, I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, and I have brought them here to my Lord. Now, if you remember from last time, and now we have this account from the Amalekite who was there, are there any things that stand out to you? Does this sound... Um, Identical? Are there some differences in the story? Does it raise any red flags for you? Who was the driver of the chariot? Because remember, he didn't drive his own chariot. Yeah, so back in 1 Samuel, it talked about his, the young man with him or the armor bearer or whatever, and, and, and Saul told him, hey, you killed me. And I guy said, no, there's no way. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to kill you. He kills himself. He kills himself. So Saul kills himself, and then the young man with him kills himself there. But we don't have any mention of this Amalekite back in 1 Samuel. And so at first glance, you think, well, are these, are these contradictory stories? Is, is he lying? Why, do you, why would the Amalekite be lying, do you think? If he's lying, I'm not saying he is, but if he did, why, why would he want to do that? Well, gain favor with David. To gain favor with David, absolutely. If you bring news that, that David's enemies have died, you would think, oh, David might be happy about that. He might reward me as the one who has defeated his enemy for him, and he's bringing me this this proof that, that Saul is dead. He might be gaining favor. He, he, well, I was just thinking the same thing, except he really might gain favor if he knows that he killed him. Mm. I killed him. Right. <laughs> Where the I think back over here, it says, he fell on the sword and died. Right. After he fell on the spear and was hanging on. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, the interesting thing is that the narrator telling us the story, he never makes it clear what exactly happened. And and the stories can be reconciled. So first Samuel, you have Saul falling on a spear, taking his own life. But of course, he may not have died immediately. And then this Amalekite comes upon and everything that we have happened here. So the stories can be reconciled there together. But it certainly does seem, as we're going to see in just a minute, that this man thought he was going to get a much more favorable response from David when he brings him this news. But David seems to accept the story as true. There's never, there's never any hint that David doubts him. David doesn't question him. or uh, there's, there's never any other version. It just seems we take it as it's, as it's written. But what's interesting, uh, the irony in this, you remember why Saul lost his kingship way back in 1 Samuel 15? It's because he didn't destroy the Amalekites. You remember Samuel showed up and he went half Agag to pieces, that Amalekite king. And so now Saul, an Amalekite that Saul had failed to kill, is now going to kill Saul. And Saul had been ordered to kill the Amalekites, and now he's ordering an Amalekite to kill him. And the irony here is very thick. But however this all works out, David seems to accept the story is true. Now how might you expect David to respond when he hears that Saul is dead. He'd be, you'd think he'd be happy. You'd think he'd be happy. Absolutely. I mean, goodness gracious, how many chapters has David been on the run for his life? Saul has been seeking to kill him, and for no good reason at all. Saul has, has misunderstood reality. He's thought that David was out to get him, and, and David has been on, on the run for his life for so long, so much so that he had to go live with the Philistines. I mean, this is not just a, hey, we had one bad conversation. This has been years of tension in David's relationship with Saul. So we would expect him to be happy, overjoyed. But that's not what happens. We keep going in verse 11. It says, David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned, and they wept, and they fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. So the nation has been defeated in battle, Jonathan has died in battle, but their king, Saul, has died in battle. And so David does not celebrate. He, he uh, instead mourns. He tears his clothes and weeps and fasts. Well, David returns to this young man and asks him, he said, where, where do you come from? Basically, who are you? And David, uh, excuse me, the man says, I'm the son of a sojourner, an Amalekite. 
Now we might run right by that, but a sojourner is somebody who's not an Israelite, but he's living among the Israelites. So he's not just passing through, but he's basically adopted. These are my people, which means he should know the rules of, of, of Israel. So in the same way, this is, this is walking right up to that line. We understand that when we have people who come from other nations and they become citizens here, they understand our laws. They're supposed to operate by our laws. If you're an American citizen, that's how it's supposed to work. And so that's what this, this man, this son of a sojourner, he's supposed to know what's going on, which means he should have known that you don't kill the king. You don't touch the Lord's anointed. So David asks him, well, how is it that you are not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? David calls one of his young men and says, go execute him. So he struck him down so that he died. David said to him, your blood be on your head. For your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. So surely, whether this man's lying or not, we, it's just not clear. But obviously, it seems like he thought he was going to get a royal reception. He was going to be welcomed in as, hey, you're the one that finally got rid of Saul, my enemy. And that's not how David responds at all. And in fact, this young man is killed. But he's executed. I don't want to sound like that David just got mad and murdered. This is the crime. This is the execution, the punishment for the crime of, of touching the Lord's anointed, of killing the king of Israel. Well, David continues to uh, mourn. Verse 17 says, He lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he said that it, or this, this song of the bow, should be taught to the people of Judah. Again, that's fascinating. We can't, we can't camp out too long. But the fact that all of this we see here in chapter 1, David's response to the death of Saul David is preserving the legacy of Saul and Jonathan. And as we go through uh, this, this song, this hymn that David has written, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't bring out the bad side. He focuses on the good thing like a eulogy. He, he's saying these, these are David and I mean these are Saul and Jonathan when they were at their best. This is the, the best part of Saul. He's not being dishonest. He just doesn't focus on the bad part of it. Now, we understand that the, the victor writes history. We, we see that throughout world history. So David could have easily ignored Saul and just kind of pretended like, well, that guy wasn't here. We're not going to talk about him anymore. But he preserves this, this song that, uh, that magnifies the goodness in Saul and Jonathan, and he commands that it be taught to the people of Judah. So once again, as we've seen so far along the way, David is not trying to rush God's timetable. He knows that God's anointed him to be king, but he's trusting God's sovereignty, God's providence. God will bring all this together in his own time. David's not trying to rush it, and he's not trying to uh, just erase the memory of Saul. So uh, we have this, uh, this lamentation, this song of sadness that, that he says should be taught to the people of Judah, and it's even written in the book of Jasher, uh, which is a book that obviously we don't have preserved in the Bible, but they had it in their day, just like we have history books now. They had history books and, and books like that at their time, and it's referenced in a few other places in the Bible. So uh, we understand that what's recorded here in 2 Samuel is also written about in other places as well. And uh, so we're not going to think about every phrase through this lamentation, but I want to point out a few things to you along the way. Verse 19, he begins, uh, he says, Your glory, O Israel, or depending on your translation you're looking at, it may say your gazelle, O Israel, is slain on your high places. For those of you who like to hunt or you've uh, been around hunters, you can imagine this big, beautiful buck. And when you see it die and drop right where it's at, there's just something about it. It's been a majestic animal, and now it's fallen. And so that word, that Hebrew word for gazelle, also means glory. And so uh, David, in using one word, he's praised Saul two different ways. He's like a mighty buck, a mighty gazelle, but he's also the glory of Israel. He's been slain. And then he uses that phrase, how the mighty have fallen. That's almost like a chorus you might think of. It, it's echoed three times here in this lamentation. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Verse 20, tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. So David's saying, don't go tell the news back where the Philistines live. They don't need to be rejoicing. You remember how the Israelite women rejoiced when David came back from battle after defeating Goliath, and they said, Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his tens of thousands. How much rejoicing there was. David doesn't want to see that kind of rejoicing among the enemy. They shouldn't be rejoicing among the Philistines because Saul is dead. 
Verse 21, uh, he actually curses the mountains of Gilboa. That's the place where Saul died. And, and he's saying, uh, look, you don't let any more dew or rain uh, fall upon you. Basically, don't let life uh, come to you anymore because that's where Saul's life was taken there. Uh, he goes on, let's see, um, he talks about Saul there in those verses until he gets down to verse 25. He says, how the mighty have fallen. He echoes that again, and then he shifts his focus to Jonathan. And he says, Jonathan, lie slain on your high places, verse 26. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Now, as you might have heard before or, or uh, seen reference, sometimes people take this verse and they try to say, well, look, there's a little something more to, to Jonathan and David's relationship. They try to imply uh, some sort of homosexuality in this relationship. But you understand, that's nowhere in the text. It doesn't say that at all. Think about what we've seen with Jonathan and David's relationship, their covenant loyalty to one another. They made promises one to another over and over. They've saved each other's lives. They've protected each other. They've been closer than a brother to one another. And Jonathan was willing to give up his right to the throne. You remember Jonathan recognized, he said, I know that God has made this promise to you that you will reign over Israel, not me, not my father. You will reign over that. And so uh, when we read this with our modern eye, sometimes we might think, oh, that sounds funny. But it's, it's a friendship that's, that's deeper than blood. And it's uh, not like the way marriages were in their time. So you hear that surpassing the love of women. And you think, well, Jonathan was married and he had offspring. David was married multiple times and had offspring. Uh, and so it just sounds strange to us, but uh, let me read this quote to you that might help. Uh, it says, a man's wife back in that day was his partner in procreating and parenting, but not necessarily his best friend or his confidant or his social peer. For David, Jonathan was the peer and the friend and the confidant that no wife could have ever have been in that society. And his untimely death, death left a gaping hole in David's soul. So they have a very deep friendship, and we've seen that work its way out uh, through 1 Samuel. But of course, there's nothing in the text here at all about any kind of sinful relationship between the two of them. And then David ends this lamentation by once again saying, how the mighty have fallen and the weapons of war have perished. And uh, to me, it's, David is a type of Jesus in mm -hmm. the way he so obedient to, to God and, and the way he uh, loved his enemies and prayed and just tries everything in the world to be a friend to his enemies and, and to uh, get along. And uh, that's love that surpasses what we think about. He, mm -hmm. he just don't do that. I mean, right. like I say, you don't kill the enemy. The guy that comes up and tells you he's been killed out here. Kind of, but he's the type of Jesus in a lot of those respects. So it's about yeah. just loyalty to God. Yeah. And everything he did is just about everything. Yeah. So when David is at his best, he is absolutely, he's pointing us to Jesus. And when David fails, we're reminded of how much more we need Jesus than we do someone like David. So yeah, here in this first chapter, in this transition period, we get the, the difference. We, you would expect David to respond this way, that he would be so excited Saul is dead, even if he's not crass or callous about it, you think, well, goodness, I'm glad I don't have to worry about Saul anymore. But that's not how he responds at all. He has deep mourning. He's preserving Saul's legacy and Jonathan's legacy there among the people. And so, uh, again, this is not a king like the nations. This is not a king uh, that we would expect him to be like. But as we move into chapter 2, we ask the question, all right, Saul's now dead. So is David just automatically king? Is there going to be any difficulty at all for him as he takes the throne? Well, I can't help but think about Proverbs 24, verse 17, that says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. We see David play that out, not just with Saul, but before the night's over, we're going to see that time and time again. David exemplifying this proverb of don't rejoice when your enemy falls. So chapter 2 uh, begins, and we see David. He's in the same place, which is Ziklag. Uh, that's that Philistine city that was given to David. So he's not, basically, he's not back at home. Uh, and so David prays. He inquires of the Lord, shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? And the Lord said to him, go up. And David said, to which shall I go up? And he said, to Hebron. So David wants to inquire of God. He wants to know God's will. He wants to be faithful and obey God. And again, we see that's the difference between David and Saul. 
David not only gets the thumbs up from God, yes, go back into the land of Judah, but he wants to know specifically, where do you want me to go? I want to go where you would have me to go, Lord. And so God tells him to go to Hebron. And, and that's a city, again, a lot of these Bible names we, we recognize, we can pronounce it, but we may not remember everything that was going on there in Hebron. But Hebron is Abraham's city. Uh, that's where Abraham, uh, back in Genesis 15 and 17, that's where God made those promises to Abraham that from Abraham, kings and nations would come from the seed of Abraham. And now, almost a thousand years later, you have King David. He's going to the city of Abraham. He's going to Hebron. And because he is one of the kings in that offspring of Abraham. So verse 2 tells us David goes up there and he takes his wives with him. Remember, he's got two wives at this point, Ahinoam of Jezreel, Abigail, the widow, widow of Nabal of Carmel. David brings up his men with him, everyone in his household, and they all live in these towns of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And you might think, wait a minute, David was anointed way back somewhere in one of those chapters back in 1 Samuel. He's been anointed. We might think of that as a, a private anointing. Here he's anointed king over Judah, but that's not the whole nation. And so we see these phases, these stages of David truly becoming king of the whole nation. Uh, by the end of our time tonight, well, David will fully be king over all the people. But it's not just a smooth process. It's not the way, it's not the way it is in England when Queen Elizabeth dies and Charles immediately became king. Even before he knew his mother died, he was automatically king. That's how it works there for them. For us we, in America, we have a smooth transition of power where you go from one president to the next and there's no gap in between. It wasn't that smooth for something like that. We really tested that this time, but generally speaking, that's what we try to do. But for David, it's just not that smooth. It, he, that anointing that he had, really, there's just a handful of people that know about it. And so now uh, these, uh, these people of Judah, they come to him and they anoint him king over the house of Judah. But that automatically kind of points out to us what we're going to see later in Solomon's life, that the nation's going to be divided. And in one sense, it's already divided. It, it really hasn't ever become a cohesive unit. And you think about all the way back to Moses and when God delivered them into the promised land, you even had some of the tribes who wanted to stay on one side of the Jordan, the rest of them are on this side of the Jordan. But by the time Joshua dies, you have the era of the judges. They're not functioning like one cohesive nation. You've got tribes and you've got clans, all this kind of stuff. And so uh, the nation is sort of divided at this point because they haven't ever really been united. In David's lifetime, we're going to see them united. And then after David dies and after Solomon dies, then the nation uh, is divided. So you've already got hints of that here because it's just the tribe of Judah who's coming to David and anointing him king at this time. Well, when they tell David, hey, it was the men of Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. You remember that from last time? Those people whom, whom Saul had delivered early in his ministry, uh, they took their lives into their own hands to go and rescue Saul's body and to give him a proper burial. So when David hears about that, verse 5, he sends messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead, and he says to them, May you be blessed by the Lord, because you showed this loyalty to Saul, your Lord, and you buried him. So he gives them a blessing. Then he, in verse 6, he gives them a promise. Now may the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you, and I will do good to you because you have done this thing. And in verse 7, he gives a request. Now therefore let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul your Lord is dead, and the house of Judah has anointed me king over them. So David sends them a blessing and lets them know, hey, I'm really thankful for the way you showed loyalty to Saul, and I trust that God is going to bless you for that. And he's essentially saying, look, Judah has anointed me as king. Will you come and be a part of that as well? Will you acknowledge me as king on both as well? So there's kind of two sides to a lot of what we see David doing here in these chapters. Everything we're told, we should trust David's sincerity. He's really doing these things for the right reasons. But it's also helping set him up so that these other, these other tribes will accept him as king. Because right now, again, he remember he had the 600 men. That's just David and his married men. And now he's got uh, the tribe of Judah has anointed him as king. And so he's trying to win over these different groups and these different factions. And all that we see David doing here in these next few chapters, we should trust that he's being sincere. But it also does endear him to the heart of the people. And, uh, and they will finally accept him as king. Any questions so far before we kind of shift in the next, next paragraph? 
how much can you attempt, attribute to God, to David's ability compared to God's orchestrating all this? Mm. See, don't we? <laughs> Uh, we think, you think, well, I did that because I thought it was a smart thing to do. You know, you did that because that was the only thing in front of you. Mm. You mean, because yeah. God presented it in front of you. Mm. I was say, we want to brag about ourselves. And a lot of times we have nothing to brag about. Yeah. And, and David would probably tell you the same thing right now. Right. Because God was with me at all. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and David is going to attribute uh, the Lord to preserving him, he's going to acknowledge that. Uh, the Lord has is with him. We remember we saw that in First Samuel, and we're going to see that again over in chapter five that the Lord, the God of hosts, is with him. Um, but that question of how much do we attribute to God and how much do we attribute to ourselves is that that unanswerable eternal question. Uh, I would say everything that is good we attribute to God and we give Him the glory, and everything that we do wrong we attribute to ourselves because we're fallen, sinful people. Uh, but even then, God's sovereign over all that. None of that's outside of his control. And, and if I could answer that, I'd be God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not expected. Yeah. So if, if David is king of Judah, that, that leaves a whole lot of Israel who is used to having Saul as king. And now Saul is dead. So the question is, who is going to be king over these other tribes? Well, verse 8, we're reminded of that man, Abner. Abner, the son of Ner, he's commander of Saul's army. And he was also a relative of Saul. Uh, but he's really the strongest man in Israel right now. All the people are loyal to him. He's been the commander of the forces. And so he, he's going to be kingmaker. He takes Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim, and he made him king over Gilead. So you see, verse 9, Abner's really the one in charge. He is propping up Ishbosheth as king. Uh, he's the only brother who wasn't in battle. Perhaps he was the designated survivor, or perhaps he's just you know, the brother that the kind of the black sheep of the family that they're not really proud of, and he was back at home. We're not told, but clearly he wasn't in battle. He's still alive, but now he's being propped up. He's going to be a puppet king for Abner. So Abner makes him king over Gilead and these other tribes there. Verse 10 says, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. You hear that? That's kind of that formula you're going to see throughout Samuel and Kings and Chronicles when it talks about kings. That's just kind of a summary statement you would have by their name in the encyclopedia. This is who they were, how long they reigned, that sort of thing. But the house of Judah followed David. So essentially we got a divided kingdom with two different kings. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Now, Verse 12 and following, we get into a battle, a battle with Gibeon. So Abner, again, he's commander of Ishbosheth's forces. And so they go out to Gibeon. And that's on one side. On the other side, you have Joab. Joab is fighting for David. Joab is the son of Zeruiah and the servants of David. And they go out and they meet at this pool of Gibeon. And so the forces line up, one on one side of the pool, the other on the other side of the pool. And so the two generals are talking, Abner and Joab. And they say, let the young men arise and compete before us. You remember with David and Goliath, it was kind of a, a representative. Let's let two guys fight it out rather than two armies fight it out. Well, now they've increased it a little bit. Let's let 12 men from this side and 12 men from this side. Let's let them fight it out. And whoever lives, they'll be victorious. And so we don't all have to go into battle. We don't all have to die. Well, 12 and 12 line up and they all stab each other at the same time. And they all fall down dead together. So that didn't really work out. Now you've lost 24 men all together, and there's still a battle to be fought. In verse 17, the battle was very fierce that day. And Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the son, before the servants of David. So David's side wins. Well, verse 18, the three sons of Zeruiah were there. Their names were Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. All right, so Joab's the one we've already met. He's related to David, but uh, it's important to, to make a note here. The reason they're related is because that name, Zeruiah, that's Abigail's sister. So Abigail and this woman, Zeruiah, they're both sisters. Remember, David is married to Abigail. So these are his nephews. Joab's a nephew. Abishai's a nephew. Asahel is a nephew. But we're told Asahel was as swift a foot as a wild gazelle. He's fast. And he goes after Abner. He's chasing him, and he doesn't get distracted. Verse 19, he turns neither to the right hand or to the left from following Abner. 
And so Abner looks behind him, he looks back, and he says, Hey, is that you, Asahel? And he answered, It is I. And Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right or to your left, seize one of the young men, and take his spoil. Listen, if you just want stuff, take it from one of these guys nearby. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner says to him, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother, Joab? He says, listen, go away. I don't want to have to kill you. Stop fighting. Turn around. Verse 23, but he refused to turn aside. So does Abner seem eager to kill Asahel? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. That's important to remember. That's going to, that's going to be a detail that's going to come up again in just a little bit. So Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of his spear. So again, he's not taking the pointed end. He's not trying to get, he's just trying to slow him down. Just get this kid to calm down and leave me alone. But he hit him so hard that the spear came out of his back, even though it was the butt end of the spear. And he fell there and he died right where he was. And everybody that comes up, they're shocked. And they stand still. So now one of David's nephews is dead. And his brother, Joab, is the, is the commander of the army. Verse 24, the two brothers who are still alive, they keep going. Joab and Abishai, they pursue Abner. And as the sun's going down, uh, they came to the hill of Ammon, which lies between, before Gia on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. The people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group, and they took their stand on top of the hill. So you got the, they're grouping up again, two sides on gathered around a hill. And so Abner calls out to Joab, listen, shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit of their brothers? Abner calls out, listen, we are all related. This is not going to end well. This needs to stop now. There's long-term consequences if we don't stop now. Back in Judges, we mentioned several lessons back, there was a time when the tribe of Benjamin was nearly destroyed for their sinfulness, and it, but the people had taken that into their own hands, and so it just didn't end well. We, we discussed that with Saul's origins and how he was from the tribe of Benjamin. And so Abner's calling out to Joab saying, listen, this isn't going to end well. We need to stop. And Joab says, verse 27, as God lives, if you had not spoken, surely the men would not have given up the pursuit of their brothers until the morning. If you hadn't said anything, we wouldn't have stopped. But now we'll stop. Joab blows the trumpet. All the men stopped, and they pursued Israel no more, nor did they fight anymore. Abner and his men, they go all through the night. They cross the Jordan. Verse 30, they return from their pursuit of Abner. When he gathered all the people together, they were missing from David's servants, 19 men besides Asahel. But the servants of David had struck down of Benjamin 360 of Abner's men. They took Asahel and they buried him in the tomb of his father, which was at Bethlehem. Joab and his men marched all night, and the day broke upon them at Hebron. So the battle's over, they're back home, but you've still got two nations, you've still got two armies. David is not ruling and reigning over all of them. The people are still divided. Verse 1 there, chapter 3, is really a summary. It's right here in the middle of chapters 1 through 5, and it, it, it helps you understand what's going on here. It says there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. David grew stronger and stronger, while the house of Saul became weaker and weaker. So what we just saw in chapter 2, this helps make sense of it. There's just going to be this long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. What we see coming up here in chapters 3 and 4 Go along with the same idea that there's a long battle and there's a war between the house of Saul and the house of David. Well, verse 2 of chapter 3, it says, Sons were born to David at Hebron. If you go through here and look, if I'm counting right, you get six different wives mentioned of David. And you get six different children mentioned. And at the end of verse 5, it says, These were born to David in Hebron. So during this time, he's got, he already had two of those wives, but uh, he's got six wives total so far, and he's got six children coming with it. And so on the one hand, he's being fruitful and multiplying, but he, it's with many wives, and that's not God's plan or God's design. But if you notice there in verse 3 at the end of it, one of those wives was the daughter of a king. And so that reminds us of what was very common in that time, that they married for political purposes. 
we we think of love at first sight and we're, we're marrying the uh, our one and only soulmate and all that kind of stuff that's a very modern idea of marriage um, there was lots of marriages in that time for political purposes because if you think about it if he's king and he married this woman from another nation and they have a child together then grandpa over there in the other nation he's he's likely to think twice before he comes and attacks david because his grandkids will be impacted by that i mean that's the bottom line of how they were thinking of it so you have these political alliances and that adds allies for david but that also puts the pressure on Ishbosheth because if if some other nation that's all around them if they have to choose between David and Ishbosheth, but he's got a grandkid over here through David. He's not going to attack David. He's going to attack Ishbosheth. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time? And so you you got these uh, you got these mm -hmm. wives and children listed, and you notice there at verse two it says his firstborn was Amnon. So who do you think, if we're thinking ahead on the story, David, he's going to be king, but eventually he's going to die. Pretend like you don't know what happens. Just off of this list of sons, who's going to be the king? Amnon. Amnon, because he's the firstborn. So we're going to pay attention to him. When we see his name come up, we're not going to necessarily like it. Um, so it looks like David's got a big family right now. That may look like a good thing, but ultimately we understand big problems are going to be coming through that. Um, yeah, so we keep going. Verse verse 6 tells us while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. So it sounds like maybe Abner's got this plot to overthrow Ishbosheth. After all, he's the kingmaker. He's the one that's put Ishbosheth up as this puppet king. And so perhaps he's got this plot to overthrow uh, Ishbosheth. Well, the text doesn't tell us if that's actually what was going on in Abner's heart, but Ishbosheth certainly thinks so. And so he accuses Abner of, of going in and sleeping with Saul's concubine. So Ishbosheth asked Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Now we hear that, we understand, well, that's sinful. He shouldn't be, that's committing adultery. You shouldn't do that. But to go into the king's concubine, that's a kingly privilege. That's asserting yourself as king. And so Ishbosheth takes this as, as an act of treachery. Being a traitor, uh, you're going into to Saul's concubine. And so David, excuse me, Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth. And we're never told what Abner was actually doing. We're not told if he was being treacherous or not. We're just told he was making himself strong in the house of Saul. But he is outraged. How dare you say these things about me? He says, am I a dog's head of Judah? Are you insulting me this way? He says, to this day, I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father, and to his brothers, and to his friends, and have not given you into the hand of David, and yet you charge me today with fault concerning a woman? He says, I am being loyal. Now, again, we're not told if Abner is actually being a traitor or not. It's possible that he is because the text tells us that he's making himself strong. It's also possible that Ishbosheth is just like his father Saul, and he's misreading reality. You remember all the times that Saul accused David of things that just weren't true? He just couldn't get a grasp on reality. So it's possible that Ishbosheth is just as worthless as his father Saul. Whatever's going on, Abner says, no, we don't need another king like Saul. Well, this is going to be the end of this situation. And so he makes this vow in verse 9. He says, God do so to Abner and more also if I do not accomplish for David what the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. He says, listen, because you've accused me of doing this, I'm going to do everything in my power to make David king over the entire nation. And from Dan to Beersheba, from top to bottom, from north to south, I'm going to make David king over these people. Ishbosheth has offended his greatest supporter in Abner. Abner is the one that set him up as king, and now he has made Abner mad. The interesting thing is, you, you see that Abner recognizes that God has promised to, to David, that David is going to be king. He acknowledges that on one hand, and he's just spent, we don't know, a couple of years trying to set somebody else up as king. And so Abner, he's just a guy we've got to keep our eye on. He, he's, he's 
you can't tell exactly where he's coming from a lot of the time. But Ishbosheth, the king, so to speak, of Israel, he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. Now you understand, a king, if you're really the king, and you think somebody's being a traitor, you execute them. But that's not what Ishbosheth does. He's weak. He's not, a, he's not a king. He had no right to be king over Israel. He understands that the only reason he's there is because Abner has set him up to be king, and now he's made Abner mad, and so he is terrified. Well, verse 12, Abner is going to keep his word. He sends messengers to David on his behalf, and he says, To whom does this land belong? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring over all Israel to you. He sends out word, hey, we can make this really smooth. All the people will come together, and you'll have a voluntarily unified nation. Well, David said, that sounds good, but there is one catch. One catch. One thing I require of you, that is, you will not see my face until you first bring Michal, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. He says, oh yeah, my first wife that everybody forgot about. I want her back. Now, again, there's, there's so many possibilities of what's going on here because David didn't necessarily abandon his wife. He didn't commit adultery against his wife, at least at that time. Now, he, again, he's taken other wives since then. But the reason they became separated, remember, he was fleeing for his life. And she was loyal to him. She was trying to help him escape that night. And then after David is gone, Saul takes her and gives her to another man as wife. And so we, we read this and we think, wow, has David, has he really missed her? I don't know, but it seems like also he's, he's getting his way back into Saul's family, the royal family. Because if he is remarried or reunited with Saul's daughter, uh, then he has that connection with Saul's family. And oh yeah, by the way, three of those four brothers who were the heirs, they're dead. And you've only got one more, Ishbosheth, and he's not looking too good as king. Right? So you see, there's lots of layers of all of this. Of what, what exactly is David doing here? How much does he actually miss the call? And, um, and how much of, of this is politics? Well, yeah. So David sends messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michal, for whom I paid the bridal price of a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. You remember that strange and interesting detail? from 1 Samuel. So Ishbosheth, the weak king, he sends and he takes her from her husband Paltiel, the son of Laish. Verse 16, but her husband went with her, weeping after her all the way to Baharim. And then Abner said to him, finally, go return. And he returned. This is just, this is just one of the multitude of examples in, in scripture of the consequences of sin. How messed up this situation is right now because on the one hand you think well good David's being reunited with his first wife but then on the other hand that was part of the reasons why they had divorce laws in Deuteronomy so that you couldn't pass wives back and forth if you divorced her you're done you're not supposed to take her back and she's remarried and she's with this man who clearly actually loves her he's following after her weeping after her so it doesn't sound like she had a bad home life it sounds like she actually had it pretty good. She's married to a man who loves her and misses her and weeps when she's taken back to David. It's just a, a picture of the consequences of sin. Verse 17, Abner begins to confer with the elders of Israel. Remember, they're the leaders in one sense, but they're not as high up as the king. They're not as high up as the general of the army, apparently, because he is going to them. And he says, listen, y'all been talking about this for a long time. You've been talking about uh, having and seeking David as king over you, but verse seven, verse 18, now it's time to bring it about. Do something about it. You've talked about it long enough. Make David king over you. For the Lord has promised David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. And so Abner uh, talks to the elders of Israel that day, but he also speaks specifically to the tribe of Benjamin. Do you have any idea why it's important that he gets Benjamin in line with this plan? Well, that's Saul's tribe. And so if Saul's tribe isn't happy about this, then it's not going to go well. But if Saul's tribe is on board with this plan, then it's going to go a lot further with all the other tribes. 
And remember, Abner is related to Saul, so these are his people. He goes to his people, the tribe of Benjamin. They just say Benjamin, but that's it's referring to the tribe, not the man Benjamin. And so uh, he, he goes and he gets everybody on board. He goes to tell David at Hebron all that Israel and the whole house of Benjamin thought good to do. So everybody's on board. He's going to be king. But then Abner, as he's going to tell David about it, he's got a little you know, security guard here there with him. He's got 20 men with him. And David makes this feast for Abner and the men who were with him. So Abner says to David, verse 21, I will arise and I will go and I will gather all Israel to my Lord the king that they may make a covenant with you so that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So Ab David sends Abner away and he went in peace. So here we're on the cusp of peace. We're on the cusp of everybody uniting under King David. But just as uh, Abner is going away, Joab comes back from a raid. And now he's got much spoiled with him. That's, that's always good news because that means more money, more, uh, more resources that they have. But Abner was not with David at Hebron because he'd already sent him away in verse 20, 22. The end of it reminds you he had gone in peace. But when Joab and all the army that are with him and they came and they hear, Joab is, is told, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king and he has let him go and he's gone in peace. You hear that repetition? He's gone in peace peace. That's not good for Joab. Joab is not happy at all. Verse 24, he goes into David, the king, and he is mad. He says, what have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why have you sent him away to, so that he's gone? You know that Abner came to deceive you and to know you're going out and you're coming in and to know all that you're doing. Joab is saying, look, Abner cannot be trusted. You know better. I can't believe you have done this. Well, we're not told David's response, remember David is sending away in peace. Joab seems to be acting very rashly because verse 26 tells us he just goes out from David's presence. He's not acting in David's authority. He's just doing what he wants without David's permission. And so he sends messengers after Abner. They bring him back and David doesn't know about it. The text is very clear at the end of verse 26. David did not know about it. When Abner comes to Hebron, Joab goes out in the midst of the gate to speak to him privately. Now, Abner's guard is down. Why do you think Abner's guard is down? He thinks everything's okay. He thinks everything's fine. He's just gone in peace. It's told us that three times. Everything's supposed to be good. And remember, Hebron, I didn't mention this earlier, but Hebron is a city of, of refuge. It's supposed to be a safe space. He's supposed to be okay there. But things are not safe at all for Abner. So, Joab brings him out under false pretenses, and there Joab strikes him in the stomach so that he dies. And the narrator makes very clear, this is revenge. This is a blood killing for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Well, David hears about it. He says, I and my kingdom are forever guiltless before the Lord for the blood of Abner. May it fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house. And may the house of Joab never be without one who has a discharge or who is leprous or who holds a spindle or who falls by the sword or who lacks bread. Now remember, Joab is David's nephew. The family connection is not a reason for him to overlook sin. Joab has gone and killed Abner. Uh, he's taken revenge upon Abner for a death that happened in war. Remember, Abner killed Asahel in war. And Joab is revenging it during a time of peace. And so this is not okay for him to do that. And even though Joab is the general and he's well-loved, um, he's doing a good job for David, but David can't overlook his sin. So David distances himself from Joab. He says, your blood is on your own head. I didn't have anything to do with this. Your guilt is on you and on your household forever. It's not on me. And we don't see this in 2 Samuel, but if you run over in the first couple of chapters of 1 Kings and you look at David on his deathbed, and David is giving final instructions to his son Solomon. One of those things is for Joab to be executed. He says, don't let Joab's gray hairs go down to the grave in peace. Finally, he, death and execution are brought up to Joab even in David's last days. So sin has consequences. We see this over and over and over in 1 and 2 Samuel. 
chapter uh, verse 30 concludes Joab and Abishai his brother had killed Abner because he had put their brother Asahel to death in the battle at Gibeon a reminder that this was in war uh, and, and he'd been avenged in peace now, verse 31 all right so how do you think David is going to respond to the death of Abner is he going to be excited hey this is an enemy this guy's fought against me no he doesn't rejoice in the death of his enemies and so he tells Joab, the very man who just killed Abner, he says, you're going to lead the funeral. He says, tear your clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourn before Abner. Notice here in, in these next verses, it transitions. David's name is mentioned, but he's called King a lot. He's not just called David, he's called King. King David followed the beer, and they, bur they buried Abner at Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. And the king lamented for Abner. You see that lament there in verse 34. Uh, verse 35, then all the people came to persuade David, look, you need to eat. You haven't eaten enough today. And David <laughs> swears, no, I will not eat anything until the sun goes down. But verse 36, all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them as everything that the king did pleased all the people. There's that emphasis then again on king. Verse 37, verse 38, he's referenced as king. So even in this, David, again, we have no reason to doubt his sincerity, that he's truly honoring this biblical wisdom that even hadn't been recorded yet, to not rejoice over the death of the downfall of an enemy. He is leading the people in mourning, but through that, the people see him as a unifier. They see him, and they watch him, and everything that he does pleases the people. They understood that it had not been the king's will to put to death Abner, Verse 38, the king says to his servants, uh, he, he's praising Abner, says, do you not know that a prince and a great man has fallen upon, uh, has fallen this day in Israel? And he says, I was gentle today, though I was anointed king, but these men, the sons of Zeruiah, are more severe than I. So he contrasts himself with Joab and his brothers versus him as king. And he concludes, the Lord repay the evildoer according to his wickedness. And you remember what Abner had promised Ishbosheth. He says, I'm going to do everything I can to deliver the kingdom over to David. Abner does exactly that, but he does it in death. Through Abner's death and through the way that David leads the people in mourning, he unites the kingdom under David. They see him, and the people are pleased with all that the king does. We'll make our way more quickly through 4 and 5, but if you have any questions or comments so far. Well, chapter 4 reminds us that, hey, there's this guy, Ishbosheth. He's back there, and he's wondering what's happened to Abner. And so he hears that Abner has died, his courage fails, and all of Israel is dismayed. Verse 2 tells you that Saul's son had these two men who are, who are captains of the guard. But then verse 4 seems like this interruption, because verse 4 tells us about the son of Jonathan named Methubasheth, who was... Uh, five years old when he was taken away when they heard about Saul and Jonathan dying his nurse picked him up and took him and as she was running away she dropped him he fell and he became lame now any idea why this this seems like interruption because verse 3 tells you the name of these generals and then verse 5 picks back up with those generals any idea why we might be told about Methuselah here at this time the narrator is tipping us off this is not the end of Saul's family. What we're about to see with Ishbosheth, you think, okay, something's about to happen to him, and then finally, that'll be the end of Saul's family. No, nope, there's still one more. There's still Mephibosheth, and we'll see him later. I think Pastor Laramie will cover that in his video lecture uh, lesson next time. So, verse 5, you've got these, these two generals that have been, these two guards, these two soldiers, uh, two captains that have been mentioned there. And so they go to where Ishbosheth is at, and it says he's taking his noonday rest. He's taking a nap. And they go in there into the house, and they're pretending like they've gone in to get weak, and they stab him in the stomach. They kill him. And then uh, they take him, and they actually behead him. They cut his head off, and they take the head. They rush through the night. They take it back to David. They say to David in verse 8, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. The Lord, Yahweh, has avenged my Lord, the king, this day, on Saul and his offspring. They think, look, 
You're going to like us, David. Here's the head of your enemy, Ishbosheth. You're going to be proud of us. Tell us what good little captains we are. What is David's response? Not that. No. He, again, doesn't rejoice over the death of his enemy. And here, as we alluded to earlier, and as David begins his response to them, he says, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. He's telling these two captains, look, I don't need your help. I don't need Saul's help. I don't need anybody else's help. God is the one who has preserved my life and kept me this long. And he says, listen, as, as Yahweh lives, when I heard that Saul was dead and that guy thought that I would rejoice and I would have nothing to do with it, this is my paraphrase here, if I was not excited when I heard that Saul died, do you really think I'm going to be excited when I hear that you've murdered Ishbosheth? He says, how much more? When wicked men have killed a righteous man in his own house, on his own bed, shall I not now require his blood at your hand and destroy you from the earth? So David commanded that these two men be killed. He has their hands and their feet cut off, and he has them hung up publicly there in Hebron. But for that head, decapitated Ishbosheth's head, he takes it and has it buried in the tomb of Abner at Hebron. So again, David doesn't rejoice at the death of his enemies. Everybody seems eager to help David receive the kingdom in their timing, but not in God's timing. Everybody says, look, we can help you. We'll solve your problems for you. And David says, no, the Lord is the one who has redeemed my life out of every adversity. Chapter 5, we finally come to the point that there's really no credible opposition anymore. The last son of Saul has died. Ishbosheth has died. We're not really worried about that five-year-old Mephibosheth. And there's nobody else. Abner's dead. There's, there's nobody that could challenge David to the throne. So now all the tribes of Israel, they come to David at Hebron and they say, behold, we are your bone and your flesh. We're your family. We're all Israelites. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you, David. You led us out and brought us in. In Israel, And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You shall be prince over Israel. Now they start remembering God's promises that they, they haven't been remembering the last few years. But now they, they're suddenly ready to make David king. Verse 3, so all the elders of Israel, they came to the king of Hebron. King David makes a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. Now we get that formula in verse 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. He's finally king. The day has finally come. So now, for these next few chapters, really from, from here where we pick up in verse 6 until all throughout the next lesson at the end of chapter 10, those are the good days. Those are the glory days for David. You'll see that next time. Everything is good. But you notice there in verse 5, it mentions Jerusalem, which we, we immediately associate with Israel. But up until this point, Jerusalem is not really Jerusalem. It's not the capital city. It's not where David has been ruling and reigning. He's been ruling Judah from Hebron, and that worked out really well for him. But he recognizes that that may not be the best place for there to be a capital that unites all of the people same way that if you look at history and you figure out how did they wind up with Washington, D.C. rather than a city in, in all the states, it's a way to unify the people. And so David says, look, we're going to go and we're going to defeat these people, the Jebusites, these people who have been all the way back since Exodus. God said, when I take you into the land, you will defeat all of these people. And over and over we saw the Israelites not obeying God, not conquering everybody they were supposed to conquer. And so David, in his first act as king of all the people, he defeats some of God's enemies, the Jebusites, and he takes over the city, the stronghold of Zion, and he builds his capital there. And that's how we get the city of Jerusalem. And verse 10 is a, is a high point for David. It says, verse 10, David became greater and greater, for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. We've heard that refrain many times before, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. But now it's getting emphatic. The Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. That's why David is being successful. In David's good days and his good moments, it's only because the Lord was with him. 
Verse, verses 11 and 12, we find out that David has this palace built by Hiram, the king of Tyre, a foreign nation who has a, a good relationship with both David and Solomon. David sends all, I mean, Hiram sends all these carpenters and masons and they build David a house. They build him a palace there in the new capital of Jerusalem. Verse 13, we get a little bit of a red flag because David, he sounds a lot like a king like the nations. He took he took more concubines, he took more wives from Jerusalem, and after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David, and you get all those names there in verse 14. So remember when Samuel warned the, warned the people, here's a king like the nations, here's what he's going to do, one of the things he's going to take, he's going to take and take and take. Well, here we get a little bit of a red flag. David's taking. That's not a good sign. Verses 17 to the end of chapter 5, you see David... Uh, defeating the Philistines. Once again, those age-old enemies, the Philistines, they rear their heads again. But David inquires of the Lord, verse 19. They, they've heard that he's been anointed king, and so they're ready to go and kill him. They're not happy with him. But David inquires of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. Here's what I want to point out in these verses look at verse 20 he says the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breaking flood it's God who's winning the battle for David not because David is such a good soldier we've seen that David is a good soldier he's brave he's a good warrior he's killed all sorts of animals all sorts of giants he is a good soldier but he doesn't take any credit for himself the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a, uh, a breaking flood and then again down in verse 24 he says, the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. We think about where we've come so far in 1st and 2nd Samuel. The people have rejected God as their king. They wanted a king like the nations, but now they have a king of God's own choosing. That phrase we use of David, a king after God's own heart. Um, sometimes when we use that phrase or we understand it to mean, well, David was just really good. He, he, I mean, he did have his good days. There's lots of good things we can learn from David. And we think because David was a, a man after God's own heart, that means that there was just something so good inside of David that that's why he was successful. But we see all these other times where David is going to fail. And really, the idea behind it is not so much that there's something good in David, but it's that David is the king of God's own choosing. The people chose Saul, but God chose David. And so God works through David, and David does good stuff, and we give the glory to God. And David does bad stuff, and we criticize David. He shouldn't have done that. There's a fourth word, David, a line, David won't cross. Mm. And that, that's where it is, right? That's God. He will not cross. I mean, he, he does things like human beings. But when, he, when it comes to God, he, he, just, he does not cross that line of, of, uh, of uh, not reverence to God or, uh, mm. or, but, or doing what God wants to do. Yeah, I mean it's you know everybody's seen it. We all we all come short. I mean, right. David, ever Joseph, Joseph not mentioning anybody. Did you read about Joseph? He never done anything wrong. It seemed like right, but I'm sure he wasn't guiltless. Still, right. So, so with David, know. yeah, David gives us a picture of repentance, and we'll see that when we have that joint session with the looking at David and Bathsheba and their sin and Psalm 51. It's not that David never sins. Not that, that he's perfect by a long shot, but he does show us repentance, unlike Saul. We remember how hard-headed Saul was and how many times Saul just would not acknowledge his sins. He wouldn't listen to the voice of the Lord through Samuel and through uh, Nathan the prophet and others. When David is confronted with his sin, he repents, and that's different than Saul. But also, again, the people chose Saul, and God allowed Saul to be king, but God said, I choose David. And I'm working through David. And God can take a flawed man like David who does many good things, but he can take a flawed man like David and preserve that line all the way down to giving us Christ. So uh, this is the beginning of the golden era of David. You'll see more about that next time. Um, and, and so we'll, we look forward to that. Any other questions or comments before we conclude? Uh, three weeks from now, our chapters will be... Uh, so three weeks from now are going to be 11 and 12 in Psalm 51. But between now and then, I'll send you an email when it's ready. Laramie's going to record a video of him teaching 6 through 10. So you can watch that at home and, and, and be caught up to speed there. That kind of keeps us on track for um, with the schedule with women and getting everything done at the right time.
And that'll be March what? March 14th. Give us homework. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Uh, does Hebron exist today as the same name? Ooh, do you know? I do not know, but I can check on that and try to have an answer tomorrow, but I have no idea. I love geography. Mm. Well, I will say the narrators assume that we know the geography, and most of us don't, and I, I'm not the best of it either. And, and so they, you know, they tell you all these places, and if they add some kind of comment, you know, they're kind of tipping you off. But for the most part, they assume you know where they're talking about. And Three thousand years later, we don't. Yeah. And, and the maps they have in the Bible, I like to see how far it is from distance A to B. Mm -hmm. How many miles they have to get there? Mm -hmm. Forty-three thousand footsteps. <laughs> some of that what kind of, what kind of terrain it is too what they have to go over right some of that I glossed over just because of the sake of time but even when they took Ishbosheth's head and they it says they went through night and it tells you the path they took well they went that path because they were hoping they wouldn't run into supporters of Saul who would get mad that they killed Saul's son and they were trying to find the fastest path to get there through the night so geography does play into a lot of it um, I just could for five chapters I had to slow down to get into the geography that much Took out his little thing that we put in the stars. Okay, then we got this mm -hmm. Other than the geological report, you all this and see the other thing that mm -hmm. I took note of one is politics was a dirty game then, it's a dirty game now. Absolutely. Yeah. David's weakness for women is going to be that the Clintons were abound. Absolutely. And David, for all the good things that we see David yeah. do. That particular area of weakness that he warns his son about, he warns Solomon about. You get the first nine chapters of Proverbs, and you get such clear warnings that are clearly designed for a father to teach his son, and most of us are uncomfortable talking to our sons about it. But the wisdom that David gives to Solomon, and Solomon passes on to his son in Proverbs 1 through 9, David failed at, and Solomon failed at. And all of when we the reason we're going to slow down a little bit, we've been taking these big chunks with five chapters at a time. Uh, I wanted us to finish Samuel sometime this year. But also, we're going to slow down for David's sin with Bathsheba because that impacts the rest of his life. The consequences, the earthly consequences of David's sin impact his family. They impact everything. The sword never left. Absolutely. The sword never departed from his house. So even though David didn't lose his salvation, he's... At the right hand of the Father, he's with Christ. He's in eternity. Uh, he's he's a Christian. Uh, to put it in New Testament terms, there's no reason for us to doubt David's salvation. But the earthly consequences that come from that one sin changed everything. So it's it's worth slowing down to think about that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pray. And if you want to hang around and talk longer, for sure, they might even save a few words for us. We'll see. Lord, we thank you. Uh, for the joy of studying your word. We know we've just scratched the surface. We've gone so fast over several chapters, Lord, but we, we can glean so much, Lord. We know that uh, you have been faithful to preserve uh, David and his line, but ultimately you did all of that to, to bring us to Christ. And, and we, again, are moving really quickly through that idea, Lord, but we understand this isn't just history. This was your work in history and how you worked to bring about your Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And so all of the, the good things that we see David do uh, we're pointing us to Christ in the same way that uh, David responded in Christ-like ways on so many occasions, Lord. We know that the only way that we can hope to do that is by your son, Jesus Christ. Because Christ has saved us, we can respond well when enemies persecute us. And we can be patient and do things in your timing. And we can stand firmly and strongly against temptation and against lust only because of what you've done for us through Christ. And so we pray that even as we leave this evening that we will be renewed in our faith, renewed in Christ, and that we would be committed to serving you faithfully in the days ahead. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.